This is a bit of a challenging hardware review actually, because depending on when I actually began to put it together, well, it could start in any number of different ways. So for example, AMD's Radeon RX 5600 XT is here, providing an appreciable boost in performance over both the 1660 Super and the 1660 Ti. Or maybe it could start like this. As a competitor to Nvidia's 16 series GTX cards, RX 5600 XT. Pretty impressive, but up against the recent price cut on the RTX 2060, maybe it's a bit overpriced. So things are all rather complex and difficult to get to grips with. So right, let's go back, let's rewind and try to get all of this into perspective. Commentators have described the RX 5600 XT launch as a bit of a mess, but what we're looking at here is an actual AMD versus Nvidia bun fight playing out in real time with prices and hardware specs in flux while red and green teams battle it out. In short, drama.com and the real winner here. Well, I guess that's customer confusion. So let's go back to the beginning and just take a look at some raw specs. The reference RX 5600 XT, it's pretty straightforward. It's a slightly cut back 5700 and it looks like this. So you get 36 compute units, just like the 5700. However, memory is pruned back to six gigs of GDDR6. The memory controller is cut back to 192 bits with lower spec, lower bandwidth modules. And boy, those GPU core clocks are really cut back there. Let's just pull a benchmark out of thin air here to see how these changes to the same chip result in a very different level of performance. But then everything changed when Nvidia dropped the price of the RTX 2060 to $300 and EVGA came out with its KO model. Now just $20 more gave you a fair amount of extra performance plus you got hardware accelerated ray tracing, DLSS, VRS and all of the other Turing goodness that's just not present within first gen Navi. Rather than cut prices on uh, its new card, AMD boosted specs instead, something I've not seen since the days of the R9 290 launch. Now let's look at the new OC spec. The 12 gigabits per second modules in the 5600 XT suddenly become 14 gigabits per second modules, just like the 5700, but still running on the nerfed memory bus. This is combined with a meaty factory overclock on the core. And yeah, you can see how that's looking on the benchmark here. Suddenly the RX 5600 XT has gained seven percentage performance points. It's up there with the 2060 and well, 5700 kind of seems to be quite a lot more money for not a huge amount more performance. Or some might say good value for the consumer, which it is, unless you bought one of those 5700s back in the day. So that's what's happened. 5600 XT gets announced, aims to demolish the 16 series, but then RTX gets a price cut. AMD declines to follow suit, instigating a series of factory overclocks to keep it in contention. And that's fine, except we now have effectively two reference specifications for the 5600 XT. And at launch, at least, you'll need to flash the BIOS to unlock that extra performance. And you really do need to make sure that the card you're buying actually has the BIOS upgrade as an option. Our review model here, the Sapphire Pulse, well, that definitely does have it. And it has a nice little BIOS switch at the top there. So once flashed, we can swap between the two reference specs at will to show the performance profiles of both modes. The card itself, well, Sapphire is AMD only. Very strong partner and uh, the products tend to be rather great. And I still have fond memories of the Nitro RX 580 which came out of the gates with specs very close to the RX 590 that came out a year later. This one has a plastic shroud, but it's got it where it counts otherwise. You've got a single eight pin power input for easy integration into a range of PCs. And on the back there, the usual AMD setup of three display ports and HDMI 2.0. Pretty standard stuff, nice card, I like it, but it's the benchmarks you're here for. Now there's talk of this being a 1080p gaming card and I think that's because it was originally marketed up against the 16 series from Nvidia. Thing is, once you reach $300 land, you're in RTX territory and unless you're doing ray tracing or some other similarly ambitious GPU load, 1440p is, I think, the better way to look at this level of card. You're certainly less likely to be CPU limited and so that's where I'm benching, 1440p. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is always a bit of a pain in the bum for AMD hardware, so why not kick off with a real challenge? 
seems to really like the new BIOS, that's for sure, because the new OC delivers a nigh on 15% boost to performance. RTX 2060 is still ahead, but only by 2.7%. The score here versus the vanilla 5700 is pretty close, uncomfortably close maybe, for owners of the higher spec unit. For those wondering, even at 1440p, the 1660 Super compares favorably with the non-OC reference 5600 XT. It's only a couple of points behind. Now, I still really rate the 1660 Super. Effectively, it's a replacement for the TI, but it's tons cheaper, but barely loses any performance. Next up, we really like Battlefield 1 because it's a mature Frostbite title and it really seems to like AMD architecture and indeed Nvidia's new Turing cards. A genuine battle here sees the reference 5600 XT command a 15 point lead over 1660 Super. Not bad, but it doesn't work out as quite a great deal in terms of price versus performance where the Super still rules. However, with the OC BIOS in place, the 5600 XT is 4% faster than 2060. It's competitor at the other end. It's cheaper than the 2062, of course. So, you know, there's nothing world changing going on here with the new AMD card, but it's, you know, it's in the ballpark. It's pretty well priced for what it delivers, right? Far Cry 5 puts forward a much more convincing case with even the vanilla BIOS inching ahead of the 2060 with the overclocked BIOS pulling ahead with a more convincing 8% lead. Again, good stuff for a card that has a lower MSRP. 5700, only six points ahead too. So yeah, you're getting the vast majority of its performance with a healthy cut to the price. Pretty much the same story with uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands on ultra settings. Even without the OC BIOS in play, 5600 XT is on par with 2060, while the enhanced model right up there with the 5700. And this is all looking pretty good, right? A similar story once more with the excellent Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where yes, the overall average across the three benchmark runs sees the 5600 XT without any OC match the 2060, while the new BIOS extends that lead to about 7%. Effectively, the last minute upgrade positions the XT in between its OG spec and the RX 5700. And you know, that's not bad. Reference model, 11% faster than the 1660 Super with the OC version extending that lead to 19%. The Witcher 3 demonstrates that the story isn't quite so cut and dried, however. RTX 2060 at 1440p maintains a 5% lead against the overclocked 5600 XT, so it's still Bit of a gap there. 16 series Super and TI sit in their own performance tier with pricing that kind of makes sense for the Super but not the TI. So I think I see where AMD maybe expected the original reviews to land. The XT would offer much better value against the TI and it would be within striking distance of the much much more expensive RTX 2060 on a whole bunch of titles. Putting aside that the 2060 Super is there and it's pretty cheap, as a story, this would fly and cards would shift. However, the 2060 price cut put a stop to all of this, requiring a bit of a rethink. The overclock addresses a lot of the price versus performance concerns, but it's not quite fast enough to cause much disruption in the marketplace. Apart from making the RX 5700 suddenly look rather pricey, if we're judging by MSRP, of course. But look, judged by rasterization performance alone, the RX 5600 XT works. It's good. But for my money, this is just outside of the bounds of the mainstream at its price point. And at $280, I suspect it's more geared towards the enthusiast gamer. And when you're laying out that kind of cash, you want a GPU that's going to last. The fact is that we're reaching the end of a console generation now and new replacements are en route. And like it or not, consoles define the technological baseline of game development for years to come. Now, RTX 2060 features hardware accelerated ray tracing and variable rate shading, VRS, two technologies that are confirmed as appearing in some form in next-gen console hardware. RX 5600 XT does not have these technologies, and for me, that's a problem. Now look, I raised this point in prior Navi reviews, and you know, back then there was still some uncertainty about ray tracing as the future of gaming graphics, but look, the next gen consoles are going to have it and even AMD's 2020 Navi cards have confirmed to be getting it. This is why I'm struggling a bit with a full-blooded 5600 XT recommendation, even though the benchmarks look pretty good. For the games of the here and now, clearly it does a great job, but 
What about the future? So here's the thing, we know that key titles like Cyberpunk 2077 are getting raid facing. And if we look at the recent Wolfenstein Youngblood update, there's exciting stuff in there that hints very positively about the future. Benchmarking RTX 2060 against the 5600 in both guises, you can see that there's not much between the two cards, as you might expect. You can also see that engaging hardware accelerated RT causes performance to plummet. But then there's DLSS. It's an emerging technology that didn't launch in an optimal state, just like raid facing. But you know, the nature of technology is that it matures and improves and the latest form of DLSS is really impressive. Now let's look at the OC5600 XT up against the three DLSS variants in performance terms with RT Active on the Nvidia side. What you're seeing here is a performance spread that can be significantly lower noticeably lower or higher than 5600 XT on the same settings. There's two things here. You've got hardware accelerated ray tracing, which you don't have on the RX 5600 XT, and you've got a choice of three performance profiles with DLSS. Again, more choice, more options, but does DLSS quality hold up? Well, I've taken a look across the board here, comparing non-DLSS to all three DLSS modes. Alex did this in his patch video and my conclusions are broadly similar to his. First of all, it's a replacement for Wolf's TAA and what's clear is that you do get more detail resolved on all DLSS modes, even the performance mode that's rebuilt from a much lower core resolution. But you do get an element of sharpening halos as a consequence and there are some areas in image quality where the low resolution source can't be ignored. Overall, comparing DLSS with native resolution rendering is kind of difficult because image processing is done in very different ways, but I'd say that you gain as much as you lose and the performance uptick is undeniable. And yeah, I concur with Alex here. I think you'd be nuts not to use it really. Oh, and how about high frame rate Wolfenstein gaming at 4K? 2060 offers that option via DLSS, 5600 XT doesn't, although yeah, performance is still pretty good there regardless. Thing is, on the 2060, DLSS can keep your 4K performance well above 60 frames per second, even at really high quality settings. I guess the bottom line is that you've got more options with new technology, and for me at least, that's what PC gaming is all about. Now, I really don't want this to be seen as a binary choice between GeForce and Radeon cards, because unless you absolutely must buy a GPU today, it isn't. What I'm saying is that an enthusiast GPU purchase you'd expect to last a couple of years at least has inherent limitations and maybe, just maybe, hanging on for a bit, not buying now, may be the best strategy of all. Hardware accelerated raid facing and other new technologies like VRS may well be within RTX cards today, but we know that they will also be in the RDNA 2.0 Navi cards shipping later this year. So on the face of it, it may look like a sort of Team Red versus Team Green face-off, but that's not what it's all about really. It's all about today's GPU feature set versus tomorrow's. Let's just remember that all of the raid facing games to date are using the DXR API. They're not Nvidia exclusive. They should run just fine on the Navi cards to come. DLSS, well, that is another story and potentially the topic for another video. But yeah, the point is that machine learning is now part of the graphics landscape. The direct ML API is a thing and you can be sure that AMD will be going down this path too. It just makes sense. Okay, so look, I hope I'm being really clear here. We're at a transition point in terms of hardware and games development. This makes choosing new PC components, the GPU in particular, somewhat difficult. And yeah, waiting is a perfectly viable option if you don't like what's on the market today. But let's be clear here, ray tracing, VRS, machine learning features, they aren't going away, far from it. All of which means that, well, you have the options in front of you in the here and now, and it's down to you to decide what's best for you if you're in the market for a new graphics card. There's no doubt that the RTX 2060 price drop has caused some issues for AMD. But the OC solution mooted here pulls the card back into contention for today's games. And yeah, if you were looking at the RX 5700 as your next GPU, well, now you have a new option that provides the vast majority of the performance at a significantly lower price point. That's pretty cool. But that's all from me right now. Please do like, subscribe, share, and all that other stuff that supports the visibility of our work. 
And yeah, you guessed it, the bell icon with its magical powers of instant notification is another must. The DF Patreon. It means we can produce the work we want to produce on our own terms. And at the end of the day, that's basically why we're here. Oh yeah, and of course you get pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end and thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.